Welcome to Peninsula Seniors Out and About. Today we're at the Western Museum of Flight in Torrance for one of their celebrity lectures. Let's go see what Cindy has for us today. Welcome everyone, I'm Cindy Maka and I'm the director of the Western Museum of Flight. We all know what the stork brings, but what do you say about the guy who brings the stork? Well, I don't have an answer to that, so I will let Lieutenant Colonel Steve Lund, United States Army, retired, tell us all about it. Steve? Thank you, Cindy. Um, I'm not standing here, obviously, dressed as a lieutenant colonel, because, again, that's in my past. Uh, my name is Steve Lund. Um, I am the uh, owner-builder of a Fiesler Stork replica, which you see on, on the uh, screen at the present time. Uh, this is a three-quarter scale replica that I spent uh, two years building to make as authentic as I could uh, possibly do. Uh, this particular airplane has been my favorite since I was about a 16 years old, and uh, I had adventure earlier had planned to uh, restore a full-size one until I realized the thing is uh, almost a 50-foot wingspan that would barely fit in this hangar and not practical. And uh, I've been flying and building airplanes for about 50 years now, and uh, the, uh, op the chance to actually build a replica of this came up later. So primarily I'm going to talk at first about the hist history of the, the Fiesler Stork and acquaint you a little bit with it, and then we'll talk a little bit more about uh, what I've done with mine. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the Fiesler Stork itself. This is probably one of the most recognizable airplanes uh, when you talk about German aircraft. Everybody but knows what a Focke-Wulf 190 and a Messerschmitt 109 looks like. And probably right behind that is the Stork or the Junkers Ju-52 trimotor. Um, these are some of the most, well, I say, signature German airplanes uh, uh, that people are familiar with. This is an, the uh, film clip you saw a minute ago was of this particular airplane, this uh, uh, full-size one in England. It's in, the, in Duxford in the uh, uh, museum there. One of the most uh, famous users of the Fiesler Stork was uh, uh, Field Marshal Erwin Rommel. Uh, he used this extensively, first in uh, the invasion of France, and realized the value of a commander's uh, uh, command and control aircraft. And he began to fly in the back seats of these. By the time he became commander of the Africa Corps, um, his pilot complained that all he was allowed to do was to crank the uh, starter and uh, the field marshal took over. Uh, field Marshal Rommel, uh, on at least three different occasions, got himself in trouble flying his own stork. And uh, you'll see that uh, in this photo, um, on his left pocket is the German pilot's badge, just like what I'm wearing on the left pocket of my uniform. Uh, so by the time he uh, was the commander of the uh, forces in Normandy, uh, he had been awarded the pilot's badge. So uh, General Rommel was a, was a firm believer in the use of the stork, and again, in the command and control role. One of the most famous things that was done with the stork was the, uh, quote, rescue of Mussolini uh, off uh, uh, a mountaintop in Italy. Um, when the Allies invaded uh, uh, Sicily, the Italians wanted to surrender, and in turn, they, uh, they arrested their uh, duce and uh, imprisoned him and with the idea of turning him over to the Allies. Uh, the Germans, in turn, wanted to keep him in uh, their side because they wanted to set up a puppet government and remain uh, in control of Italy. Hence, uh, they needed to, to uh, capture uh, Mussolini alive, he was held in a, uh, in a uh, mountaintop uh, hotel, 6,000 feet above sea level, and uh, the Germans uh, 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 attacked it, or shall we say, uh, 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 enveloped it with 12 gliders full of uh, paratroopers, and in turn captured uh, the garrison, and uh, then they were stuck with the fact that they were on the mountaintop owning that, and the uh, Italian partisans, or the other side of the Italians, owned uh, the real estate at the bottom of the mountain, so was elected to take him off the mountain by uh, Fiesler Stork. The uh, stories go many ways about uh, Otto Scorzani, the SS captain that was on board. Uh, as far as his role, uh, he was actually sent along as security, but uh, he took all the credit. 
And in turn, um, when they got ready to take off, he climbed in the back seat to the, uh, to the pilot's chagrin because this thing was uh, about a 10,000 foot uh, density altitude day. This aircraft is nominally a three place, but normally a two place airplane. And Scorzani was about 6'4 and about 250 pounds, and he got in anyway because being an SS man, he could uh, wield enough threats to get his uh, message across. So eventually uh, they took off, and uh, it was a pretty heroic takeoff, and only because Captain Gerlach, the, uh, the Luftwaffe pilot flying the aircraft, was skilled, they were able to get uh, in helicopter flying, we call it a pinnacle takeoff. You go over the edge and then you dive until you have enough airspeed to fly. And that's basically what he did. Uh, this is a good painting of it because it get, illustrates, uh, not exactly uh, correctly, but it illustrates the uh, uh, plateau that the hotel is on. And you can see some of the gliders in the background uh, that uh, brought the troops in. The, uh, this aircraft was really well known throughout uh, the German chain of command. Here's a picture of Goering about to climb in his own stork and leave. Uh, it's not thought that Hitler ever flew in one. Uh, his flight detachment owned two of them, but they used them for like couriers, messengers. This picture was taken from inside the back seat of a stork. And if you look, you're looking at who's who in the, uh, in the Third Reich. Uh, Goering on the left, Ernst Udet, Hitler himself, Rudolf Hess and even Mussolini there on the right. So uh, all these people were very much familiar with this aircraft, so it was quite famous. One of the most famous in the last wartime exploit uh, that's been attributed to the Stork was Hanna Reich's flight into Berlin. Uh, what happened was uh, Goering got fired about four days before Hitler committed suicide, and uh, he uh, named uh, General Witter von Grimm to uh, take his place summoned General von Grimm to come to the Fuhrer bunker, which of course was under siege at that time. And so von Grimm flew the stork into, uh, into Berlin, literally over the Russian army. And by this time, and incidentally, a stork uh, normally has, does not have dual controls. This one didn't either. And what happened was uh, Hanna Reich, uh, famous German test pilot, was in the back seat. Von Green was wounded and passed out. She reached over him and flew this thing in and landed it on the, uh, on the uh, street in front of the Brandenburg Gate using nothing but throttle and stick. Again, you know, couldn't touch the pedals, they're too far away. Quite a feat of airmanship. And uh, she pulled it off, landed it on a city street, saved it. Um, some of the reports you hear about her flying him out and, uh, or rumors that she flew Hitler out are all uh, rumors because uh, the uh, stork itself was so damaged actually going, coming in and then they folded the wings and parked it in the tear garden and you can see in the lower uh, uh, right hand corner of this picture that's what it looked like after the war. It was just shredded by artillery. Uh, she actually flew out in the back seat of a uh, Arado 96 trainer flown by a German NCO, her and von Grimm. So that's the real story that happened but again a very commendable piece of airmanship to be able to land this aircraft uh, from the back seat uh, reaching over a, an unconscious pilot. Uh, this aircraft was unique. Uh, there was nothing in the Allied inventory that came close to it. So as a consequence, uh, most of the Allied VIPs had their own as these things were captured. Uh, the one that's attributed to Dwight Eisenhower is actually in the Smithsonian at Silver Hill waiting to be, uh, waiting to be restored someday. Uh, Winston Churchill flew around Normandy uh, in, the, in a Storch uh, flown by uh, British uh, 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 Air Captain uh, Broadhurst. Uh, Field Marshal Montgomery had, had one that he flew around in North Africa with. Probably the last uh, uh, event that the Stork was uh, tied to in, in World War II was the, quote, last battle. Um, the last known aerial combat on the Western Front was a Piper Cub shooting down a stork. <laughs> and it's uh, comical and sad for, uh, for the, uh, the stork crew because uh, two days before the end of the war, this uh, Lieutenant uh, Francis and Martin were artillery spotting for an ar armored column that was approaching Berlin. And they spotted this stork flying at treetop level uh, headed west and very likely headed to surrender because uh, their luggage was on board. And, uh, they swooped down in the cub, and they had to swoop because the cub is about 10 knots slower than the stork. 
and opened the door on the right side and took their 45s out and emptied their, uh, their magazines into the cockpit of the stork. On the second magazine, somebody hit the observer in the heel. That's how, when, of course, any of us in the military have shot the 45, say that's about par for the accuracy of that weapon. The, uh, apparently, the uh, observer started screaming. The pilot panicked and uh, crashed the airplane. So uh, the uh, Piper Cub crew landed beside him and captured these guys. So that was there happily ever after. I've gotten, uh, had the opportunity to fly uh, two storks so far um, of the full-size variety. Again, I had uh, at one time I had planned to, uh, to restore a full-size one before I realized how impractical owning one is. Uh, this one is in Medford, Oregon, and it did not have dual control, so I, actually what I got was a ride in this one. This one was in, um, in Lancaster, owned by Steve Erickson, who used to take it to air shows uh, uh, around the West. Probably, Steve is probably the highest time current uh, storage pilot in this country because he's got over 500 hours in this airplane. The difference is it has an IO540 um, Lycoming engine in it instead of the, the uh, German Argus like the other airplane had. But uh, the great thing about this one is it has dual controls. And I got two hours of uh, takeoffs and landings in this thing. The, Ironic thing about it was we could do all the takeoffs and landings within the perimeter of, uh, of Lancaster Fox Field. Uh, this thing is so incredibly uh, maneuverable at, slow, at low altitudes at, at, or low air speeds. Um, people often ask me, well, if you put so much work into an airplane, because again, this is my second replica stork that I've been flying, why didn't you build a full-size one or own a full-size one? And I say impracticality. Um, as you can see, the storch is the size of a Mustang or a de Havilland Beaver. And I say the wingspan is 46 feet. It's almost, I could say, barely fit in this hangar. And it's not a very practical airplane in that respect. So uh, my reply to that is that, uh, no, um, I'll stick with the replica. <laughs> Uh, there have been about five different replicas of the Storch. Probably after the Mustang, this is probably the most replicated uh, of any of the warbirds to date, uh, to my knowledge. And uh, they come in various sizes and various uh, degrees of authenticity. Uh, the one at the top there, the ragwing stork, is, is actually a wooden replica, about 65%, and it barely resembles one, is the way I put it. The one below that is called the uh, preceptor uh, they call it the Stole King, and it's, I would say, stork-like. Um, it's about, uh, its wingspan is about uh, uh, two feet less than mine, and uh, like I could say, much less authentic. The Carlson Cricket is about an 80% size. It's bigger than mine. It, it uh, uses a Czechoslovakian inline engine called a Walter Lom. The sad thing is the, uh, the builder of this aircraft, the designer of it, was killed in it and uh, his widow sold the rights to a company in, in Eastern Europe, and we haven't seen anything about it since, so it may sometime come on the market. The one below it, the Pasmani uh, PL9 Storch, is a, is a pretty good replica. As you can see by the uh, cowling, it's not very authentic, and it's quite a bit bigger. It's about 500 pounds uh, heavier than my airplane and uh, uses a 150-horse engine because of that. The most common uh, storch uh, replica that's out there is by Nestor Slepschlev, who uh, originally was uh, in uh, Australia, although he lives in, in operates out of Serbia now. This is a 70% size airplane, and uh, I'll talk a little bit more about my version of that there as well. As I said earlier, this airplane's been my favorite airplane since I was about 16, and, and that photo there is what inspired me. I went to a, a model airplane contest in 1962 and uh, met this kid, Rick Elwood, who was just finishing a free flight version of it. And I really liked the airplane from that day on and eventually resolved by the time I got out of high school that I was going to restore one. Uh, below at the bottom is a, is a uh, Gillow kit, one of the flying models of it I built over the years, and that was built about 1965 or so. After I gave up on deciding to build a uh, full-size or, or uh, restore a full-size one, um, Nestor Slepsev um, arrived at Oshkosh in 1995 with this 75% replica. And I basically resolved at that point that I was going to own one. So I bought 
one of these kits to this in 1998 and began building it with the idea that I would make the most authentic storage model, or should we say replica, that uh, had been made to date because the basic design Excuse me. The basic design uh, is not totally authentic. Uh, the major changes, and uh, I, I refer to it as a sports plane that resembles a storch. Anyway, um, about 19, about two, year 2000, I had been uh, corresponding with a, a fellow in Arkansas who owned a, a, a Slepsev stork that uh, he had built, and uh, he had many times invited me to come fly it. And so I was going to go out to uh, Missouri with a friend at, at that time, and I called him, and uh, he said, well, yeah, you come out and fly it, but you better hurry because I lost my medical and I'm going to sell it. So we negotiated uh, over the next week, and I wound up buying this airplane from him. And when I got it home, we found basically I had about a year and a half's work to make it flyable. And uh, it's a Slepsev Stork with a 75-horse uh, uh, Rotax 618 engine. This is the two-cycle you know, you add the oil type, um, sounds like a lawnmower, um, but that got me flying storage uh, replicas. Uh, I got about, uh, oh, close to 200 hours in this airplane um, and flew it up until this one came on the market. And friends of mine uh, alerted me to the fact that this was out there. This is a cricket aviation uh, storage replica, 75% size and an incredibly authentic replica. And at that point, I resolved to have one. And uh, this photo was taken by me, the top one, it, at Sun and Fun in 2007, when I plunked my money down to buy the kit for mine. This is the only one uh, for many years that was in this country, and the only other one with a Rotax engine in it. Uh, again, uh, they were not too, very authentic uh, in several ways to include, if you look at the cowling, uh, it's markedly different than uh, the real thing. Um, I had uh, ordered a, uh, a kit, and uh, at that point, uh, once I took charge of that, then uh, I began to build it. The uh, aircraft below is one of their demonstrators. Uh, I collaborated with the company to such a degree that that airplane's engine installation is identical to mine and because we fed information back and forth. So I kind of consider myself part of their developmental uh, uh, program. The airplane you'll see outside is a uh, specific airplane. It's The markings of it are not that of a generic storage, but a, of a specific one that was uh, photographed in Russia in 1941. It belonged to a... Uh, a uh, ground attack unit called Schlock Group 1. They, they had uh, two uh, squadrons of uh, Henschel 129 cannon-armed anti-tank aircraft and two squadrons of uh, Messerschmitt 109s. The uh, storks were used for forward air controllers and pilot rescue and, should we say, all-around courier duties, you know, go back to the group and pick up the maps, uh, go pick up the replacements, that sort of thing. So these were all-around what we call squadron hacks. So when you look at the markings uh, on it, you'll see that it has a Z on the side and it's in a green color, and, and uh, I'll talk about that uh, afterwards. So I, uh, once I finished this airplane, uh, I had considerable uh, development work ahead of me, but this is a photo of it. Uh, actually, before it started flying, uh, you'll see a, the prop is a natural wood color. That was part of the devel developmental program. And, uh, since then, I've had some real adventures with it. Uh, there it is taking off in a field down by Lake Elsinore, and it's really showing itself off in that regard uh, as far as uh, short takeoff and landing. That was an uphill takeoff. One of the things that I concentrated on is uh, authenticity on this airplane. I call this scale details. Um, what you're looking at there is a cockpit photo, and the next photos you'll see are top and bottom the top one will be a photo of the real thing, and the bottom photo will be a picture of mine. You'll see in this photo here, for instance, the uh, placement of the, uh, the uh, bicycle chain mechanism there, which cracks, cranks the flaps down, the uh, stick even down to the way the uh, stick is, uh, is wrapped with, uh, uh, nylon, or with uh, cotton cord, all to look exactly right. The instrument panel, center panel, I'll say, uh, is set up exactly like the real one with the same instruments, so only, again, scaled down because this is three-quarter scale. 
And believe me, that, that, that runs you into expense. The 3 and an eighth instruments, uh, like the uh, turn slip indica indicator in the center, only costs a couple hundred dollars if you uh, have it 3 and an eighth inch, but when you miniaturize it, uh, it gets to be about 800. But again, it has to be all miniaturized, otherwise it won't, won't, won't fit. But you'll see uh, the layout, the airspeed indicator is upper left, same as same. It has a turn slip indicator, the clock's in the middle. Everything fits the way the real stork is. And I did this for two reasons. One, for authenticity, and secondly, because um, when you look at it, or when you fly it, you, you're properly conveying what it really felt like. All kinds of details like these sunshades. You'll see the drawing of the uh, rear sunshade and then the photograph of the, uh, of the front one. These uh, are fitted to the real aircraft exactly the same way. They're one of the first scale details I found that was absolutely necessary. This thing is a greenhouse. In the summertime, you know, the temp is just out of sight. You can't just wear a baseball cap. So uh, I fly with the sunshade over the pilot all the time in the summertime. If you look at the cowling on the airplane outside, you'll see that even the join lines and the intakes and all the openings and stuff are exactly the same as the real one. Underneath the cowling, you'll see an oil cooler and exhaust stacks, again, the same. If you look very closely on the exhaust stacks on the lower ones, the, uh, the real exhaust stack is inside. But they're the same color, the same shape, and the way they're supposed to be. External details like uh, access panels on the outside of the airplane. The fuselage rear access, the same way. Even the first aid kit, if you'll notice up there in the upper left. There's a better shot of it there. Cabin air intake. The bullet above the uh, cabin air uh, actually works. The only difference between mine and theirs is the fact that uh, the, uh, the actual one has a flapper valve that something like you see on the front of a carburetor and, and uh, I just leave it open all the time. The aft cabin bulkhead, the seats, all the same, meant to look right. And the whole idea is that um, not a lot of people are gonna get to see the full size stork if you're here on the west coast unless you go up to the Paul Allen collection in, in Everett. And so my, my job is to convey as close to the whole thing as I can. One of the things I'm especially proud of is this uh, replica machine gun. This MG-15, 7.9 millimeter machine gun, uh, was used on the, uh, pretty much all the later war versions of the, of the Storch. There's actually no <clears throat> record of uh, one ever shooting a Russian fighter down with it or anything, but it, uh, it's impressive. But that gun is four feet long. So when you make a three-quarter scale replica, obviously you can't use the full size one. So what I did is I took a, a 22 carbine, the one on the bottom there. It has a right looking uh, uh, barrel jacket and uh, receiver and extensively modified it into the, the gun you see the, um, with the magazine. In fact, the magazine is made from a German gas mask container, so it's you know, somewhat semi-authentic. Uh, <laughs> One of the things I like to throw out to people is they say they really start to look at it close and when you're standing on the back of the airplane and you look at it, the, uh, the gun says 22 long rifle and they say, well, how can you shoot anything down with this? And I say, three-quarter scale airplane, three-quarter scale gun. And then I ask them what uh, three-quarters of 7.9 millimeters are and they, their eyeballs go back and they walk away. But it uh, would be roughly a 22 caliber. So it's as authentic as we can make it. Uh, if you, Peek down the barrel, you're looking at a three-quarter scale gun. Most of this replication, uh, I've said before, stops at the cockpit wall or the, the firewall. And uh, typically a Rotax engine, for instance, has six, uh, uh, six bolts to hold the prop on and looks just like a modern uh, uh, application. The real Stork had a single spline shaft and one nut holding the, the prop on with a roll pin through it. So what I did is I developed a, uh, a replica of even that installation. Um, that uh, black spinner-like affair uh, is uh, actually made of ABS plastic and, and uh, the uh, hex nut in the middle is, uh, is aluminum uh, bar stock. But the effect is it looks just like the real thing and that was the whole idea. So from the prop nub all the way back to the tip of the tail, this thing is meant to look like the real thing and you shouldn't be able to see many uh, differences to it. I want to show you my two favorite shots of this airplane. This was taken off that part of that uh, flight out of Elsinore, um, the takeoff out of it. And then this one, uh, uh, you'll uh, look around and you'll 
see some of my reenactor friends, uh, when we have uh, uh, battle reenactments out in uh, the desert and whatnot, uh, one of my missions is to overfly and uh, uh, participate in the exercise. The first time I did this, it absolutely brought the house down. Uh, one of the uh, Allied commanders uh, was talking to his men, and one of his guys glanced up and said, oh, that looks like a German observation plane. And they went back talking, and a few seconds later, he said, it is. And uh, making passes over them, uh, uh, like I say, really brought the house down. Uh, kind of the reverse to that, though, was uh, I got to see something I hadn't seen from Vietnam when I looked down and saw muzzle flashes directed at me. So uh, it, it uh, sometimes looks pretty authentic. Anyway, so my mission there is to, uh, to overfly, and, and what it is is I, I uh, supply the ground troops with, a, with one of my handhelds, and I give them real reconnaissance information, real time. In fact, the German troops are always outnumbered, so sometimes that can be a critical difference uh, in a battle. Uh, my ultimate desire with this reenactment stuff is that one time we'll find a place where we, a venue where I can land and participate and be part of the, uh, uh, of the operation and, and operate from that. Because uh, the typical use of the stork was that at division level, was as short range reconnaissance. So you'd have one of these parked by the Division uh, Tactical Operations Center, and that's exactly what I want to do someday. So that's, that's my ultimate goal with this. And I say where to from here. Um, I've done a few other things with the Storch now that uh, it's flyable, like say since 2009. Um, these are some shots I took of uh, using my, the, the previous Storch and uh, different uh, uh, EAA fly-ins and, and the like. Uh, in fact, the middle slot there, uh, you'll see in the background Steve Erickson's full-size Storch. You can see what a difference is when, uh, when the other aircraft towers over you. Uh, some of you have been to uh, Wings and Wheels and Rotors at, the, uh, at Los Alamitos. Uh, the first year they did it, uh, my friend Joe Riley and I took our, his Cub and my Storch, uh, the other one, uh, to, the, uh, to the show. and. Uh, typical of Army aviators, we're flying along in one mile visibility with this, what you see in the background is the way that it looked that day, that was all smoke. That was the, uh, the day that the uh, 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 SoCal Center got uh, run out of uh, uh, Miramar because of uh, the brush fires, the, the, like Southern California was on fire. But anyway, uh, that particular cub was marked up uh, with the words Miss Me on the side, which was the, the same uh, color scheme as the one that shot down the uh, stork at the end of the war. And uh, we resolved not to uh, reenact that particular thing. <laughs> the uh, Hawthorne Air Show there is at the bottom. And there's uh, another reenactor friend of mine. Uh, uh, we're at the Chino Air Show in 2007. And now these are shots of uh, my, the current stork you see outside. And that's his, uh, uh, El Centro and uh, Camarillo. And pretty much every year from now on, I'm going to be doing air shows with this aircraft. I've already taken it to the, uh, to the uh, El Centro air show uh, uh, about two weeks ago um, and been to the cable air show with it uh, in January. My favorite reenactor job, though, is reenacting with the nurses. Um, this is part of a photo shoot they did, and uh, this, is, this is where you want to be. You know, if you want to choose uh, who you're going to commune with, do you want to be with sweaty paratroopers or the nurses? Um, <laughs> so I'm perfectly willing to put the Red Cross on the side of this aircraft and change roles for certain occasions. Right, Woody? <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I better explain myself on that one. That's a good friend of mine's wife. We're good friends. That, that's the way it is. Uh, um, uh, but like I say, I'm happy to commune with the nurses. I'll conclude with this, uh, a couple slides more. Um, kind of a lifetime ambition. When you build an airplane, kind of the, the holy grail is to take it to Oshkosh. And in 2010, uh, that's what I did with this airplane. This is... Uh, an epic flight when you're flying at uh, 75 miles an hour. And uh, it took me six solid days of flying in each direction. And uh, average speed turned out to be about 68 miles an hour because of headwinds uh, going home. And uh, in turn, uh, it was 
pure pleasure. Uh, everybody says, you know, what, what were you doing with all this? Did you have to land and stop for fuel a lot? Well, this airplane has 30 gallons of fuel and burns about five gallons an hour. So I stopped once a day. So the rest of it was just slogging along. And uh, personally, I had a great time. I wasn't bored ever. Um, you know, the astronauts never asked for TV because they spend all their off time in the space shuttle looking down at the Earth. And it's kind of the same way for me. I've been flying for 50 years now, and I'm still fascinated by it. And uh, this was a real pleasure trip. Um, I carried camping gear with me and so forth, but uh, I stayed in motels and, and with friends pretty much the whole way. You'll see it's kind of an unusual loop up there because the, uh, the initial trip out, I stopped in Michigan and stayed with a friend who owns a full-size stork and has a hangar full of stork parts. And my idea was to uh, spend a couple of days with him. I did a 25-hour inspection and an oil change on the airplane and spruced it up and get it ready to take to Oshkosh and then flew over from there. I'll conclude with this one because that's how fresh and good I looked at the beginning of that flight. The way at the, end, at the end of a flight was quite a bit different. I'd been on the road 20, 21 days and whatnot. But it was, uh, like I say, it was uh, the culmination of a, of a lifetime dream to build an airplane and take it to Oshkosh. And people say, are you going to do it again? It's, Hell no. <laughs> <laughs> it's great fun, but uh, um, it's one of these once in a lifetime things. That concludes what I have to say about my airplane, kind of shooting my mouth off about something that uh, I'm really proud of. But again, I did it as a, as a salute to this particular airplane and to make it as authentic as possible so that people could enjoy having a good idea what it, um, what it really looks like. Um, I'm going to do a demonstration uh, flying it this afternoon and try to show you what it can uh, do as far as performance goes. Thank you. I'd love, to, I'd love to entertain questions, and uh, we've got time for that. Yes, ma'am. She asked uh, if I could uh, explain the Z on the side of the airplane. What it is is if you look at photographs of German combat airplanes, there's always a single letter on the side in a different color. And what it was is the, uh, the squadrons within a group are called Staffeln, and uh, generally they would uh, be six to eight aircraft, depending on the type of unit. And each of these Staffel would have a different color, like red, blue, white, or yellow. The, the universal uh, headquarters color was green. So this means that this aircraft belonged to the headquarters of that group. And there would be another one of these storks in there with a Y on it. So there'd be two of those aircraft in the, uh, in this, in the uh, group. And you had another question. OK, yes. The uniform I'm wearing is that of Captain uh, Heinrich Gerlach, the pilot that flew Mussolini off the, uh, the mountaintop in, uh, in uh, Italy. And uh, we have good photographs of him and, and how he looked. He certainly looked a lot younger than me. But uh, what I'm wearing here is as a pilot, uh, transport pilot's combat clasp. Uh, Captain Gerlach's real assignment was he was a JU-52 transport pilot and he was, a, he was assigned to General Student's staff. Below it, you have an Iron Cross first class, and the ribbon in the, the buttonhole is the Iron Cross second class. And uh, then below that is the pilot's badge. And this is what, uh, again, what uh, Captain Gerlach wore before he got his Knight's Cross for, for that heroic uh, flight he made. Yes, sir. <laughs> uh, he's a good question. Uh, Three-quarter size uh, airplane. He says, uh, I don't look to be three-quarter size. He's absolutely right. How do I fit in that airplane? Uh, actually, this airplane, very well. Um, if you climb into the full-size one, it's like climbing into the cab of a crane. Um, I still have uh, headroom in it, even with that saucer cap on. Um, the, Stork front cockpit is, is uh, about that of a Piper Cub with a little bit more headroom. Uh, the back seat's a little cramped. Um, certain friends of mine, like Jim Thigpen, really don't fit. So I have to pick and choose who, picks, who gets to fly in it. That's the, uh, he says, how about the width of the cabin? That's a, that's a slam dunk. If you'll notice, the windows of the aircraft angle out. 
And th this was meant for observation. You can look straight down without having to bank the aircraft at all. That gives me about this much elbow room. It's very comfortable. Um, like I say, flying it uh, all day, every day for six days wasn't, uh, wasn't a big strain. Kind of one of the biggest problems I had was developing the right uh, combination of foam for the seat cushion. <laughs> Yes, it, yes, uh, was the width of the cabin three-quarter size. Yes, exactly that. The dimensions of the aircraft are, are scaled down, but again, the full-size cabin carried three people. And uh, if you look at the uh, back of mine, you'll see the, the seat back, and there was 24 more inches of, of, of cabin behind the seat back on the full-size stork. That's where the third person mm -hmm. sat. So it works out. 75% um, airplane is still doable for a full-size person. Yes, sir, you in the back. Uh, good question. Because of the stole performance of the uh, Storch, uh, why isn't this a, uh, a big popular aircraft with bush pilots? Well, first of all, rarity. Um, the engine on that particular airplane has always been a very unreliable one. So they were, by the end of the war, or after the war, the French converted them to building them till 1956, and they put radial engines on them. In turn, um, that makes it not too practical. Secondly, the airframe is really quite fragile. Um, there's things about you can wipe the tailwheel off it if you're not careful trying to turn it around. Uh, if you look at the uh, geometry of the airplane, you'll find that the landing gear is tilted forward. And the idea is that the landing gear is not on the CG like it is on a Cub. So when you touch down, you're not going to go over on your nose no matter how quickly you stop. In turn, that means that the, the tail is very heavy. So it's not a very practical airplane to haul around the bush. It weighs 3,000 pounds. That tail weighs 400 pounds. So, you know, whereas I've been out in the bush with a Piper Cub and pick up the tail and whip it around myself, couldn't possibly do it with a stork. Um, that's why uh, you, you see de Havilland Beavers and uh, Super Cubs and whatnot. But, Basically, the rarity and the uh, fragility of the airplane, the reason why it didn't, didn't continue. What he's saying is uh, uh, you could probably take the uh, characteristics of the Storch and uh, turn it into the ultimate bush pilot plane. That's almost precisely what the Helio Courier was. It has retractable slats instead of fixed wing. Uh, the wing geometry is virtually the same but it never outperformed the stork. But uh, the, the aircraft, like I say, too, were always too rare. So uh, I don't think it was ever considered to use them like we see uh, surplus Stearmans were uh, crop dusters after the war, but uh, you never saw Storches used to that degree. Um, yes, sir. Uh, he asked if everything in there is three-quarter three scale and to include Mussolini. Yes, Mussolini is three-quarters in size, but not in weight. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes. Uh, the question is, uh, when the Mussolini rescue took place, did uh, Scorzani, the SS captain, Mussolini, and the pilot Gerlach all fit in that cockpit? Yes, and that was the big problem was, like I say, it was terribly overloaded for that density altitude, and uh, they still managed to pull off a takeoff. Yes, sir. Okay, well, he's asking about the markings. I said that this is a, an aircraft from Schlock Group 1. And uh, was it captured on the Russian front? Is that why the picture taken and so forth? And how was it used? Well, actually, no, this aircraft uh, is in German hands in that photograph. And uh, I say it's on the Russian front. Um, it was used probably in, in that capacity as a uh, forward air control aircraft, basically spotting for the uh, attack aircraft. Um, Jim Thigpen and I are both uh, Cobra gunship pilots. And normally, we would never go into combat with just Cobras. We always had a scout helicopter to find the target. So when you come up over the tree line, you need to know that he's uh, heading 270 degrees, uh, 400 meters out. And this is the sort of thing that that aircraft would have been used for. Did, did the Germans have a tank killer airplane like the Russians did? Uh, question is, did the Germans have a tank killer airplane like the Russians? Yes, called the Henschel 129. This aircraft was a single seat, 
uh, I call it a prehistoric wart warthog because it has very much the same capabilities. It was a single seat aircraft with twin engines. It had a cockpit that was literally an armored box. It was literally sheet steel. And the pilot sat in a very cramped cockpit but was completely surrounded with armor. It had two 20 millimeter cannons and uh, two machine guns in the fuselage and a 30 millimeter cannon on the belly. And it was a tank buster. And they only built about 400 of these. And the Russians hated them so much that when they captured the Henschel factory, they sent all the workers they could find to Siberia and all the, the uh, Henschel 129 pilots they could find to Siberia. They hated this thing so much. Uh, my flight demonstration will be after we finish here. <laughs> uh, yes, sir. Uh, what altitude did I fly to Oshkosh? About 3,500, except going over the, uh, the mountains. Uh, uh, the highest altitude I had to operate was, was 10.5. Um, one of the problems with the Rotax engine is it has uh, Bing carburetors and their altitude compensation falls off alarmingly at about 7,000 feet. So it's not a real high, good performer at, at uh, high altitude, but over the Great Plains, about 3,500 feet. Yes, sir. Uh, good question. The question is, uh, how does the performance of my replica compare to the, the uh, full-size aircraft? I'd say better. Uh, the wing loading. The wing loading on a full-size Storch is about 11 pounds per square foot and mine is 7.5 pounds per square foot. Uh, Full-size stork, and on a calm day like today, it'll get off in about 250 to 300 feet. I can do it in about 100 to 150 feet. And landing roll about the same. Um, I can slow fly this thing at 25 miles an hour. Uh, real storch stalls at 32. Now, I've seen air show uh, performances with the real storch doing better with a little bit of a headwind. But uh, overall, like I said at one point, I'd really rather have this one than a full-size one. Um, it's easier to fly, um, and it performs very much like the real one. Uh, one of the great things I got to do when I got to fly with uh, Steve Erickson, he showed me techniques that he used and so forth, uh, right down to trim settings. And I find that mine does exactly the same thing as the real one. You start out with neutral trim and 20 degrees of flaps, and you open the throttle and with the stick in the center, and the tail comes off by itself. And as soon as it does, you lift it into the air. Full size stork, my stork, same way. So it's really, really interesting in that regard. Um, it uh, performs um, authentically, but even better. The only downside is they say the full size stork's top speed is 109, and there is just no way mine would ever be that. Uh, <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, how significant is the prop wash to the lift? Um, it's very important, actually, more on landing because uh, the tail does not have a high lift device on it like the wing does. And if you just come in at a three-point uh, Aranka Champ uh, Cub uh, uh, configuration, three-point uh, landing and about three feet and pull the power off, the tail will fall off, or not fall off, but fall, fall through. So uh, my landing technique is always carry a little bit of power so you have a little prop wash over the tail. That's the significant part. On takeoff, it's, you know, it's immaterial. Are the leading edge slats fixed? Uh, are they leading edge slats fixed? Yes, they are. They were on the real one. And the only time the Germans ever put uh, retractable slats was on a, uh, an aircraft called the Fieser 256, which was an uh, aircraft about the size of the Helio Courier and carried five people. But uh, they're fixed, again, it's as authentic as you can get in that respect. Not only are the slats fixed, but when I crank the flaps down, the ailerons droop 10%, just like the real thing. So even the uh, mechanism of the controls is, is authentic, which makes me, like say, feel that I can pretty much duplicate the real aircraft's performance. Ah. He says he's seen, uh, he's gotten to fly Steve Whitman's uh, Buttercup that had uh, leading edge slats. <laughs> and he could fly at 20 knots in 20 knot wind backwards. I can't do that. 
aileron response on this stork is, is not very good. And uh, you know, I'm a helicopter pilot too, but I wouldn't try to hover this thing in a wind because quite simply, you don't have the control uh, authority that you need to do that. So my landings are pretty docile in that respect. Okay, it looks like no more questions, so we ought to go fly, huh? I'm here with Stephen Lund. That was an excellent lecture you gave. Can we have a walk around of the plane? Certainly, we, let's go this way, thank you. What you have before you is a 75% sized replica of the uh, German Fiesler Fi-156 Storch uh, observation plane. This is a home-built airplane that I built uh, over a period of about two years from 2007 to 2009 from a kit uh, built uh, from a company in uh, Columbia, South America called Cricket. Um, the airplane itself is more than uh, the usual replica that uh, you'll see in uh, uh, the EAA magazines. This particular airplane is meant to be as authentic a replica as, as can be uh, done. The uh, features you see all around it, you'll, uh, we'll point them out in detail, are meant to convey the real airplane and there are no external things on it that convey a modern airplane except for uh, radio antennas and the like. Some features on this aircraft that convey the real thing uh, are here in front of you. For instance, the propeller is the exact shape of the real Storch propeller. propeller. The trademark, Heine, is the manufacturer of the real Stork. The, uh, Spline shaft, uh, single nut and uh, spinner, exactly the same. The join lines and the cowling are the same. Likewise, down to uh, underneath the cowling here, we have an oil cooler and the exhaust stacks. They also replicate the real thing. Join lines of the cowling, the Argus trademark, all meant to convey the real aircraft rather than a replica. Most replicas uh, pretty much stop at the cockpit wall or the firewall. In this case, that's not the case. If you look at the instrument panel itself, the layout of the instruments is identical to the real aircraft. With norm normal uh, replica aircraft, pretty much the replication stops at the cockpit wall. Uh, in this case, I've gone beyond that. If you look at the instrument panel itself, you'll see the airspeed indicator, altimeter, uh, turn slip indicator are all in the, in the locations that the real one had to include this uh, instrument light above. The idea is, is that what you're looking at is the same layout, same type of instruments, only of course scaled down because this aircraft is three-quarters scale. Otherwise, the me it's meant to look the same as the real thing. A few other things uh, in the cockpit that are, are uh, replications. Uh, the real Storch uh, Fi-156 C2 and subsequent had a tail gun and as a, a to, for rear defense. Likewise, that's replicated back here as well. Uh, and of course, it's a three-quarter scale gun. The full-size one is almost four feet long. As you can see, that wouldn't exactly work out in an airplane this size. Uh, up here, too, you'll see the crew defense weapon. A survival weapon in a combat zone consists of a weapon to protect you from the people that shot you down. And they carried typically two of these in, in the back of, of a, of a Fieser Stork. Again, replication uh, meant to look like the real thing. Just a couple more features on uh, the aft fuselage of the aircraft. Um, this was an access door on the uh, real storage. This is uh, my baggage compartment where I keep the uh, support equipment for the aircraft, and it's hinged. Likewise, they had an external uh, access uh, first aid kit uh, for various reasons. Uh, this is actually fake. This is simply a, a hatch that doesn't go anywhere. And then this uh, aircraft's uh, other features, right down to the number of ribs in the, uh, in the vertical fin, are correct. The effect, like I say overall, is that at, at most air shows I go to, most of the people think they're looking at the real aircraft, which, of course, was always my design. Now let's look for a minute at the uh, overall appearance of the aircraft, the uh, camouflage and markings. On a German aircraft, what you're looking at is all heraldry. There's no decoration here. Everything has a specific meaning. The only thing that conveys the modern aircraft here is this yellow N number. Uh, and that is in the location that normally the aircraft serial number, the, as it was called Werk number, would have been applied either in yellow or in black. So again, as close as to real as possible. The markings overall, uh, the red of the trim tab, 
the individual markings all mean something. If you look at the triangles up on the uh, on the uh, wing there, those designate yellow designates fuel, and the octane of the fuel is located in that. The black triangle conveys that this aircraft belongs to a ground attack aircraft uh, unit. The uh, Z, the green Z you see there, conveys that the, the green color designates the headquarters element of a, uh, of a group, and the Z, there have been a green Yankee and a green Zulu uh, stork in this uh, unit. So there have been one more just like it with a Y with the same uh, color. At the, uh, up by the nose, you'll see a, uh, what is the infantry assault badge, the equivalent of the American uh, combat infantry badge. That belongs to one of the uh, squadrons within the group. And in turn, that's uh, a badge that you would see on a German soldier's uh, uniform. The uh, triangle up on the uh, cowling is in brown, and that designates oil. And that's where you, you uh, service the aircraft with the oil. And the uh, orange trademark you see is the Argus trademark of the uh, engine manufacturer. So as again, everything you see is, is heraldry and is authentic. Uh, at this point in the war, rather than having the crosses with the black in center, on the top of a wing there were simply white outlines. And on the side and below they had the black uh, filler. Again, um, as authentic as I could make it. I'm here with Jack Pritcher, and he brought something that fits right into this event. Jack, can you show us a little bit about your truck that you brought? Sure, yes. Good morning. This is a 1940 Ford one and a half ton truck used in the German uh, military. This particular one is set up for the Luftwaffe. Wehrmacht is the armed forces, Air Force is Luftwaffe. So that's why it has the license plate. Uh, it is painted in the 1943 color of its, which is basically a tan color. Uh, used from Africa uh, on through Russian front and through uh, the end of the war. Well, the, the body style on this truck is basically a, a grain hauler. And the, there weren't very many specialized military vehicles. They just used farm trucks and take them into military service. And uh, we can go around to the other side here. These trucks are common in, in any military type service. Here at an, at an airport, they bring bringing in supplies for the planes, ammunition, uh, film equipment, fuel, uh, that type of thing that would be needed uh, for uh, aircraft uh, landings and takeoff, recover their equipment and personnel. Well, this truck, uh, I'll talk about the markings. This is the the license plates used uh, throughout Germany, even today, WL Wehrmacht Armed Forces L Luftwaffe. So it's uh, military air force, and license number. This is uh, the emblem for uh, Ramke Brigade, which is a, a Luftwaffe Fallschirmjäger, Air Force paratroopers, a uh, very famous uh, unit in the North Africa. Later, that officer, uh, Rampke, became a general of a, of a division, so they put a, lines around it and made it the Rampke Division in uh, Normandy. So that's just the markings, uh, and that's our uh, Ford truck, 1940. Thank you for watching Peninsula Seniors Out and About here at the Western Museum of Flight and Torrance. I'm Betty Wheaton. I'll see you next time.